Uh, so I'm going to talk about the web, not just JavaScript, though I think JavaScript has an a important role to play still. It's, as Pamela said, it's weird, but isn't everybody. Uh, other languages have their quirks. Dennis Ritchie, who uh, is uh, no longer with us, wrote an, a very humble and awesome history of C and talked about how it gained its quirks, like the bitwise and the single bar or operators in an earlier language, B, were actually used for logical and bitwise purposes, and they split them. And that also explains why the precedence is, is kind of strange. So um, the reason to get into this is because there's something important happening. Over the next 10 years, some people estimate that we'll get 5.6 billion more people on the internet using the web generally, using internet protocols, and they won't be using PCs. They won't be using um, big fat Windows PCs. They'll probably be using smartphones, and I would say tablets. I don't know if that's true here, but I hear from people I know in China that restaurants are now using very cheap Chinese tablets instead of printed paper menus because they can do a soft menu and the cost of the hardware is so low. So new devices will be the first way these 5.6 billion people get on the internet. And that, that has some implications. Um, it's also becoming true that we're, we're even more plugged into our devices and they're plugged into us. And I don't just mean Google Glass, so that's, that's coming. Um, people now forget how to socialize. They just look at their phone all the time. Um, not necessarily a good thing, but it's happening. And it, it matters for things like not just communication, but payments and other kinds of messaging that aren't phone calls anymore. Um, and of course, photography and mapping and uh, online shopping has been with us for a while, but it's becoming really easy to do from your phone. This brings with it challenges, opportunities, promises, a threat as a promise, and, and you know, people are worried about what, how can I protect my privacy? Um, what about you know, surveillance by government or other bad actors? Uh, I don't have all the answers for this, but I do think that the user who just ran off stage is an important part of this. And that's where Mozilla focuses its mission. We're trying to put the user first. We don't want anybody to be locked into a particular part of the web or use a particular search engine. It's good if there's a winning one, there always will be a better and uh, you know, probably fairly dominant solution at any given moment. Things like search, that's great. But the web is always evolving. And if you look at the history of it, it's not that old. This is roughly the number of days since Tim Berners-Lee uh, launched the web. That's not many days. And I like to say that the future is bigger than the past. So we'll figure this out. We just have to do it in the context of the web, this evolving standards-based system. And it's going to go very far. It's going to go down to the ambient computing level, to the very miniaturized level. All around us will be computers, your house, your car, yourself. They better be using open standards, in my opinion. You're going to have problems, interoperation problems, um, you know, malware problems, surveillance problems. They need to be open in the sense that the web is, not just open standards, but evolving living standards and open box specifications, things that you can learn from using your dev tools or your view source. So that's really the Mozilla mission in a nutshell, is to put the user first, keep the web evolving. We have to do it through um, making competitive products. If we didn't have Firefox, if we didn't have any Firefox OS launching around the world as we have, we would be losing influence. And maybe we, we will. Somebody else might carry the torch, but I'm going to talk about us from the Mozilla point of view because I think we achieve a lot of our goal of focusing on the user first. And to the extent we don't, there's no reason people will use us. We take down silos. This is a silo falling. It looks like a dirty one. Maybe that's Android. Um, but, you know, <laughs> as an OS, it's fine. It's based on Linux. I'm going to wave the open source flag because the Linux kernel is there under the hood. It has a, a version of Java that some of the apps use, not all of them. And um, I don't think we need that. We want to empower users ultimately, people, right? In this, the Tron sense of I fight for the users, not, not the bad sense Jack Dorsey decried of users that you treat badly who aren't really your customers. We want every person to be able to uh, empower themselves, ultimately, by becoming developers if they choose to. Um, so 
if people really deserve this platform, why isn't it as good as it should be? It's getting there. When we started HTML5, it was in a, a pub in San Jose, California, after a W3C workshop on compound documents. It was really about XML and how a bunch of plugin vendors and people who were enthusiastic about XML were going to replace the web with XML. And so Halcon Lee and Ian Hickson, who was then at Opera, um, and Dave Hyatt of Apple and David Barron of, and myself from Mozilla went to a pub and we, we said, this is not going to work. Let's just do HTML5. And that was where it started. We announced it with Opera. Apple came on board a little while after. Hixie went to Google and is still there working on it. And he'll tell you it's version free. There's no number on that orange shield. Um, it's a living document. And that, I think, matches the biological metaphor, which is actually in a paper I read recently that's very interesting, I won't get into. We don't have versions of software on the web. We have constant deployment on the server side. We have browsers that range from the old ones we hate that are fading away slowly and I think will go away faster in the next few years to very modern browsers that have new capabilities every six weeks. And those capabilities can be detected and, and people writing content such as all you find people can gracefully degrade. This is not a perfect system, but it's the best system I've ever seen at its scale. I don't think there's anything like it uh, that's been demonstrated otherwise, and certainly there's no versioning. Another thing about the web that's not as good as it should be, it lacked APIs that were needed to talk to all the facilities on your modern smartphone or your tablet. In the last five years, we added some of those because even laptops had a gyro compass or accelerometer or some way of telling when you were tilting it. And we added location services, um, but not fine-grained radio-based location. So this shows the Firefox OS architecture, which again, per our mission, has no Java Dalvik, no native stack, no Objective-C, Cocoa, Core Graphics. It's all web on top of Linux. And that meant we had to add a bunch of missing APIs. And those APIs uh, sometimes deal with privileged sensors, things that require permission, where we can this is typical on the web, we weave the granting of that permission into the interaction design so the user knows what they're doing. In a few cases, it's hard. There's a regulatory reason with a dialer app, or there can only be one dialer app, or the dialer app has to have superpowers. It's very dangerous to start giving apps lots of powers. Android went down a bad path there by saying there are 57 capabilities, permissions you can bundle with your app. I think PhoneGap turned them on <laughs> and suggested you turn some of them off, but people forget. And so you end up with apps that immediately, as soon as the user installs them and everybody wants them, they, they take your, your contacts and they, they turn on um, access control list events and they can tell when mail is being sent. This, this is an issue. So in Firefox OS, we've tried to minimize the authority granted to applications and require the user to grant authority without bothering the user or confusing them. And it's tricky. And we're trying to standardize this too. This is an effort that's been going on two years now. We actually had help from Samsung because they were interested in doing similar things in Tizen, which has, among other stacks, a web-based stack. And we did get them to patch WebKit before it forked to have a few things like battery status and network information and a few other such APIs. So we're making progress. We're closing the gap. Um, I mentioned Android. I should mention Apple. I do give credit to the innovators who make proprietary systems at first. Apple did that. They made a smartphone that was beautiful and fast enough. And remember what Jobs said when they launched the first iPhone. He said, the web finally works on a phone. And in fact, that was their only app stack. That was their only framework for building applications for about 10 months. I believe the reason that they added native apps, I'm told this by somebody who was at Apple uh, at a high level, is because of games. Game developers wanted to go to the metal. And indeed, people say the web is still slow. Like Grumpy Cat is not content. Now, there are lots of reasons why you might have performance problems on the web. The network stack and the interaction of different layers in the system fetching images and hitting the DNS server, that, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit there to fix, and we'll be fixing that. We're working with Google as much as we can on protocol-level fixes as well as just better engineering of the different layers. Layering is a problem in software. You get miscoordination. The network stack is probably responsible for much of the evident user-facing performance problems. Steve Souders of Google talks about this a lot. 
JavaScript's in there, but it's, it's down the list. But this is .js, so I'm going to talk about JavaScript. And again, talk about games. For Firefox OS, we don't have a native developer kit. We don't have any way of a game developer writing um, C++. We're already having a game written in C++ and taking it to the metal and losing safety, among other things. There's always a scary step when you install such an app. It could do anything. It's not just bounded by permissions, as in Android. It, it's really unbounded. It has the full power of your user identity. We like to take games as the acid test. As Patches says, if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. And so if you can run games or other intensive native code written in C++, generally, OpenGL, as a speaker earlier mentioned, grew out of GL. When I was at SGI, that was the only graphics library and became WebGL. We, we have been developing at Mozilla an approach called ASM.js. It's not anything but a subset of JavaScript. How you optimize it is up to each engine, and you can see from this chart that Chrome has done great work. They're, they're catching up, and one of these micro benchmarks, one or two of them, they're actually ahead. Shorter is better, closer to one is closer to the speed of native. You can see that the second micro benchmark down, uh, Firefox is at the speed, for all intents and purposes, of native code. The bottom six are macro benchmarks. Zlib is one of them. There's a couple of physics engines, Box2D and Bullet. Box2D, Firefox is less than 1.2 times slower than native. That's, that's closing on where portable native client is, uh, which Google's just uh, put into Chrome. And that says to me that we're, we're going to get the performance as close to native as any other system, which I think says this, this approach will mean people can compile existing games existing programs, scientific programs, that are written in C++ to JavaScript. And they will not have to rewrite them, because rewriting is a huge cost and usually means you make mistakes, you add unpredictability due to the garbage collector, due to recompilation, speculative recompilation in the JIT engine. If you're writing C++, if you have C++, you shouldn't have to rewrite it. And in fact, we have games like Where's My Water, running on Firefox OS thanks to Emscripten, the tool that, that uh, Lone Zakai at Mozilla Research pioneered that happens to generate ASM.js. So here's a video that shows, usually I play demo this, but I'm not going to try that today. Um, Unreal Engine 3, which we've cross-compiled, Epic hosts this demo online, and they've just recently certified it as usable in Firefox as well, and Chrome now, and of course Opera, which is based on V8 and Chromium. So, this is a cross-browser technology. It's replacing plugins. You can use just Emscripten, ASM.js. You can use Web Audio. Game developers know how to match their audio library to Web Audio. And WebGL, of course, is pretty important. I don't think I have audio for this, though, so if somebody could help me on that, that would be great. Might be nice fault. So far, it's just moves music. This work of using Emscripten to cross-compile Unreal Engine 3 took about four days. There were some bugs, there were some library mismatches requiring some hand coding. Um, it makes the point that I wanted to clarify from the Dart talk that ASM.js is really not about numerical computation, it's about C++ or C. If you have code written in those languages, any LLVM front-end language, you don't have to rewrite it by hand, you can cross-compile it. And then the question becomes, can you match the library calls that you need, and you can. There's a foreign function interface. So ASM.js code can make method calls, and of course its own C or C++ function and method calls turn into JavaScript method calls. This is the sanctuary level. This is pretty awesome. Um, lighting effects, all WebGL based. And you'll see somebody with better skills than me playing here, so it'll be entertaining. Um, this isn't just a demo. We're working with Epic still on Unreal Engine 4. We promised that at the last game developer conference. We also have a number of licensees of Unreal Engine 3 using Emscripten because they get the source to make their games available on the web. I'm not announcing any here, but they'll be coming out this year, maybe next week, I'm not sure. There are a lot of games that use Unreal Engine 3. Uh, and there are others that are using Emscripten on their own engine. So this is important evolutionary step in the web. And it, the approach we use avoids stutters, avoids what's called jank by mapping the C++ memory, dynamic memory, to a typed array, one of those WebGL structures that has definite element types. In64 is coming, but currently in 32 and smaller. It's unit 8, a byte. This allows you to treat a definite piece of memory as the physical memory that the C++ or C code wants. So that's, that's how we 
got games and other such apps onto Firefox OS and, and Firefox, and we get them onto the web because now Chrome and, and other browsers are running them well, and I believe um, we have signs of interest from Microsoft. Nothing um, private here. This was in a Channel 9 video with Anders Helsberg and Steve Luco, who created and led the team that did Chakra and IE9 and I10 and now 11, and Luke Hoban. And they were talking about TypeScript, but in the middle of that talk, they talked about ASM.js, and they were enthusiastic uh, for a number of reasons. One of them is the games, another one is TypeScript could use ASM.js techniques. So that's the state of the progress now. There's more to talk about. I'm gonna talk about two fairly big problems that I still think are solvable in an evolutionary fashion. The first is pause-free garbage collection. JavaScript, when you use it, if you use it a little bit, you don't care. But if you use it in something that's doing 60 frames a second animation and you have a lot of garbage piled up, it may be that the next allocation triggers the garbage collector and you get a big pause and you lose a frame. And users see this and it doesn't look good. So there is a, a body of work from computer science research on what are called real-time or pause-free or stopless garbage collectors. And I, I'm familiar with Metronome from David Bacon and company at IBM Research. There's also something from uh, Jan Vitek at Purdue called Hierarchical Real-Time GC. The first thing in there is Philip Pietzlow, who's now at Apple working on JavaScript core, very good hacker, very smart guy. So I'm hoping that we'll see pause-free garbage collection come to the major JavaScript engines. It does have a cost, there's no free lunch. It trades utilization, both space and time, for predictability. But it can get rid of these janks and get us back into the 60 frames a second smoothness we want, even with handwritten JavaScript, not just with ASM.js. It also needs to isolate, or have the programmer semi-isolate or quasi-isolate different heaps or heaplets, uh, as the Pizzola VTech work calls them, so that you don't have what might be considered a form of priority inversion, where the, the real-time GC is held up waiting because of some connection to a slow heap that has non-real-time guarantees but is now made a cycle or a connected graph involving a real-time heap. This hierarchical approach is interesting for a number of reasons. Up references are guaranteed fast. Cross references have a barrier. This looks a lot like iframes and windows. This looks very similar to the capability model we use for security in, in Firefox, which I think all the other engines have adopted. I think IE had a similar thing all along, and uh, WebKit grew it um, sometime after Firefox did. So there's hope that we'll get better control over memory, even in hand-coded JavaScript, and it won't require too much painful API use. It should be fairly easy to design and, and use. The second problem is really the, the general problem of how do we go the last mile in running native code as efficiently as possible, let's say as efficiently as Google portable native client, because I think that's the thing to compare to. Portable native client is, is coming along. They've been struggling for a long time getting rid of undefined behavior inherent in LLVM, which is really a compiler framework. Compiler writers don't care about unspecified behavior in C. There's a lot of rope there for optimizers to go hang themselves with. And so LLVM was not good for the web for interoperation, but there's been work at Google to wring out that undefined behavior. Still, it's a huge pile of work, and it requires a separate Pepper plugin API, which is really not specified at all, it depends in detail on a bunch of Chromium and Blink code. So it's very hard to standardize. But in an evolutionary jump, recently when, when Google um, started getting ready to launch Portable Native Client, they also provided pepper.js, which is a subset of Pepper emulated in JavaScript for Emscripten. And they are actually saying you can use two tool chains. You can use Portable Native Client, targeting the Pepper API in Chrome or Chromium, Browsers, you can then, for other browsers, use Emscripten and Pepper.js. In that, that race to see which is more fit, which gets to more users faster, which can evolve faster, my money's on Pepper.js. The missing things that it can't emulate with the existing facilities of the web APIs include things like threads. Also something we're interested in, which is mixing and matching handwritten JavaScript and ASM.js style JavaScript, where all the memory is, is mapped into a typed array, so that you can have pointers between them and you can have V tables that are efficiently jitted in the, in the JavaScript objects. SIMD is coming along. This is, this is relevant to Dart 2. I saw John McCutcheon of Google tweet about adding SIMD intrinsics to 
Dart, which is great. These are single instruction multiple data. Think of them as short vector instructions. They're in all the hardware. Game developers, DSP hackers, digital signal processing hackers, others use them. You can write efficient audio decoders um, in them. And, excuse me, <laughs> um, and you don't have any um, facility like that in JavaScript today, but by adding the Dart and requiring Dart to JS to run that code efficiently in, in browsers other than Dartium, there was a need to add them to JavaScript. So I, I tweeted back at John, and we got together with Intel and inside of the ECMA standards body, which is now moving on a fast, sort of rapid release, waterfall process, pipeline process of ES6 and ES7. So we're working on these for ES7, and we think we can get it done. John has a polyfill on github.com, John McCutcheon's ECMAScript underbar SIMD, which you can look at, and you can use. It won't be fast, of course, because it's, it's purely a, a polyfill, polyfill that's emulating the APIs using loops. But pretty soon, Emscripten's going to try to map that to some SpiderMonkey extensions that put those vector instructions right down in the jitted code, the machine code, and it'll be four, three or four times faster, depending on the vector unit size. The GPU is the final uh, piece of the puzzle, where WebGL, obviously, is, is, a, is a great technology we're using. We wouldn't have Unreal Engine 3 running like that if we didn't have it. But it's, it's doing only certain things well. Other things that GPU could do are hard to do without a more general purpose language. And WebCL has been proposed and worked on in the Kronos group. It still doesn't have a great safety story. It's relying on memory management, and it's relying on advanced GPUs like NVIDIA makes, but on phones you don't have those. So we're not sure what to do there, but we're gonna keep working on it. And finally, there's interesting work with the Rust programming language from Mozilla Research, which is used for the servo engine we're developing, to which Samsung's contributing. Rust on the GPU, this is from Indiana University uh, in the United States. Uh, Eric Holk uh, is the grad student there who did this. And that looks very attractive because Rust is full of parallelism. It has airline style tasks and it has, uh, it can have SIMD intrinsics of course and it has uh, other facilities that match the sort of constrained, sh no shared memory environment or limited shared memory environment of the GPU. So I'm optimistic we'll, we'll fill in this last mile of, of performance and functionality. And I think developers demand it, I hope you do, because developers always say give us web standards, right? But then <laughs> sometimes you get um, the problem that by the time you're ready to use the, the last standard, the, the next one is, is, is changed. Um, mostly compatibly, occasionally you get caught when something's in draft status. So that's an issue, and I don't mean to make f too much fun of it, because we have to be careful not to break compatibility. That's, that's a key part of the web's evolutionary story. Um, and it's, it's a price to pay. In the big picture, in my view, it's, it's much easier to evolve the web to than to replace it. Consider things like Dart, portable native client. Again, consider the iPhone. These are great innovations that sometimes run ahead of the standards. But if they run too far ahead, they can't be standardized. And if pieces of them could, could be standardized quickly, everyone will benefit, people will benefit around the world. If they're only in one browser and it doesn't have enough share to compel the others to support, the technology in its complex, full, integrated form, which may not be specified, may not be actually well designed, then it won't happen. So I think inve investment in, in evolutionary steps and filling the gaps is important, and that's why I've got my name on this extensiblewebmanifesto.org site, where we talk about filling in the missing lower level capabilities and letting everybody, including you all, make the higher level libraries, make the scene graph libraries and the physics engines for games, make the higher level widget and model view controller libraries so that we don't try to put those into the W3C because they, they're not very good at API design compared to the totality of GitHub. So I say GitHub for the win and I endorse the extensible web manifesto. Thank you and I'll always do my traditional closing, thanks.